deducting what the uh, what AI can contribute to the problem as not a you know what I mean? It's sort of a long term uh, balancing of the ledger. So that's really important. Yep. So that's interesting. Um, does OpenAI intend to build tools that will specifically impact science and engineering, or will you be more focused on sort of business and consumer applications? Um, for sure, we intend to do that. I think the most, like personally, the thing I am most, most interested in is how we use AI to increase the rate of scientific discovery. I believe that is the core engine of human progress and that it is the only way we drive the sustainable economic growth that we were talking about earlier. People aren't content with GPT-4, they want GPT-5, they want things to get better. Um, everyone wants like more and better and faster. Uh, and science is how we get there. So of all of the things, of all the great things that AI will do, um, I am personally most passionate about the impact that I hope it will have, expect it will have on science. That said, um, it may, this may all be more one-dimensional than we think. Um, if we make a great AI tool that can help people solve any kind of problem in front of them, that can help people reason in new ways, uh, that's great for consumers, it's great for scientists, it's great for businesses, it's great for education. It, it, it may, the, the G of AGI in general is sort of the surprise piece. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. Now I come back to your comment about, you know, sort of getting in your old car and driving to the library. You know, a lot of the, the, the creativity part is still human, but a lot of the um, aggregating all of the knowledge that you that you can use as a launching point can really be expedited. You know, by asking a few key questions on the AI Totally. I mean, again, the, 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 what any one individual and certainly what any group of us will be capable of, um, I think it's gonna. If we could go see what each of us can do 10 or 20 years in the future, I think it would astonish us today. Um, it, you know, it's like, maybe in a few years, it's like each of us has like a great chief of staff or uh, like PhD student or whatever, and LG1 that's off, like helping us optimize ourselves and do our best work and our best ideas, whatever. And then maybe at some point, it's like each of us has like a full company full of like brilliant experts of anything, um, just working super productively together. Cool. So, you know, what do you have, what advice do you have for you know, a lot of young researchers or people who are aspiring to be young researchers in the audience? Uh, what's sort of your general advice uh, for making a real impact in the world? And, I, you know, you alluded to it in terms of thinking about possibilities and not sitting in your bedroom in the dark. I think that's a good base recommendation. Um, but I'm just wondering what else, uh, what else you might want to say to this audience about that. Um, first of all, I think this is probably the most exciting time to be launching your career um, in many decades, maybe ever, I don't know, but it's like whatever it is, it's a really big deal. And the fact that you have this huge tailwind means I think you can, um, I think you take more risk than usual. I think if you do something that doesn't work out, there's just gonna be phenomenal opportunities for a long time. Uh, I think you have, you can have more impact than normal, and so there's like a premium on, you know, having this be a period where you work really hard. I certainly would be biased to do something with AI, um, but like, of course, I'm going to say this, and maybe it's wrong. Um, I think in general, the, the, the kind of core, the, the most important to, lesson to learn um, early on in your career is that you can kind of figure anything out, um, and that no one has all of the answers when they start out, but you just sort of like, stumble your way through it, have like a fast iteration speed, try to like drift towards the most interesting problems to you and be around the most impressive people and have this like trust that you'll successively iterate to the right thing and, and you can kind of like, you can do more than you think faster than you think uh, and people, it takes a while to learn that lesson um, but it, 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 it gets, mm, you know, you see it work a few times and you really start to trust it. Um, and so like, you can just do stuff. Sounds like not real advice, or like very empty advice, but I think it's like, it's, it's much more profound than it sounds on the surface. I, the other thing I would say is, figuring out relatively early on, and this takes some practice, kind of like what your own personal, I don't even know what to call it, like passion, mission statement, like 
the kind of way you want to spend your time or what you really care about. Um, and we talked about like this concept of like techno abundance as a way to drive um, like prosperity and better lives for people. That that's been something for me that has always really resonated, and I always tried to figure out like how to work on that. But having some sort of like letting letting yourself develop some sort of like guiding principle of how you make decisions about how to allocate your time and where to try to like steer things. That that was like that's been very helpful to me. Yeah, I think that's follow, follow your passion and also, you know, from you're painting a picture of a world where there's sort of infinite possibilities and, you know, doing you can't always be so strategic about what you think is good for you to do. You want to do something that imagines all those possibilities and follows those passions. It, yeah. For me it's like like passion is not quite the right word. It's like something closer to like what is the moral obligation for me to work on? And then, and I, on like the really bad days when I'm not having fun, that's somehow like, it's much more motivating than mm -hmm. just the thing I like doing. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Um, another element of this, and this is actually a really core part of uh, MIT's culture, is entrepreneurship. And so we have a lot of aspiring entrepreneurs, so there's, you know, developing the sort of underlying ideas, but how do you think about building um, successful companies in today's ecosystem, and what part of the value chain should new, where, where should new startups sort of focus their effort? Again, I think this is like the best time for new startups in particular in a very long time. Uh, startups tend to succeed uh, right around the time of big platform shifts. Big companies are slower and less innovative than startups, but they have a lot of other advantages. Um, when you get the speed and iteration and cycle time advantage the most is when like the ground is shaking. Um, and right now, I think you can, there was like a moment like this right when the internet happened. There was a moment like this almost smaller after mobile. Uh, there was another moment also smaller after AWS and this idea of like cloud services. And then for a very long time, like more than a decade, we've just been sort of waiting and I think now we finally have a new platform. And so, if history is a guide, which usually it is, and I suspect it will be this time, um, it's an amazing time to start a company. And the advantages you have as a company are you can move much faster, you can like, live in the future more than like big companies that have quarterly or, you know, or whatever they have planning cycles. Um, and that's how you win. This is a great time to do it. Excellent. I think there's a lot of people here who. Uh, or to take that to heart. Can I say one more thing about that? Um, I would issue like a, that was all the positive. Um, here, <laughs> here's a warning. Um, with any new tech platform, you can always drive phenomenal short term growth. And so you have this class of AI startups, like you used to have a class of mobile startups, and before that, like you used to have a class of internet startups, that were not building an enduring business. Um, but instead, we're building this sort of like novelty thing that was, and and you kind of delude yourself because you get amazing fast growth, and because there's this like magic new technology and you know the dust hasn't settled yet, just because there's magic new technology, it does not excuse you from the, the laws of physics of the business. You still have to figure out a way to build um, some sort of switching costs, some sort of relationship with customers, some sort of compounding advantage over time. And in the in the gold rush moments, I think startups at their peril often forget that. Mm -hmm. So you still have to like do all the things a business always has to do. Yeah, that's really that's I think important and important advice. Um, you know, the other thing, you know, it's interesting how this question was phrased, and I'll read it in a minute, but now that I've heard you talk a little bit, I might phrase it a little bit differently. The question was phrased, in what ways might technology like ChatGPT threaten versus help the future of work? But uh, it sounds like you, you tilt much more towards help, but also thinking about, you know, what that means in, in real terms. How does, it, how does it help people in their future employment? One of the things that annoys me most about people who work on AI is when they stand up and with a straight face say, oh, this will never cause any job elimination. Yeah. You know, this is just an additive thing. This is just going to, it's all going to be great. Like, this is going to eliminate a lot of current jobs. 
And this is going to change the way that a lot of current jobs function. And this is going to create entirely new jobs. It, that always happens with technology. Um, it's probably never happened this fast, although again, we may be like drinking the Kool-Aid too much, and the inertia of society may be such that it's slower than we think. But I kind of expect we're only a generation or two away from the models that, for the first time, show some degree of real economic impact. Good and bad. Um, but something you can measure. And there will be classes of jobs that totally go away. There will be classes of jobs where you can change what you do a lot. There will be classes of jobs where the productivity and compensation, whatever you want to talk about, whatever measure, goes up by like a giant factor. Um, and then there will be things that feel like jobs to the people of the future that to us today look like a complete indulgence and a waste of time, as what many of us do today would look like to people from hundreds of years ago. Uh, I think as long as you believe that humans very deeply want to create and be useful and feel like they're making like relative differential progress, all of which are things I would bet on hard, um, we're not going to run out of things to do. Um, I love reading contemporaneous accounts from people living through previous technological revolutions and what they say about, man, we're all going to only work four hours a week if we work at all, and we're just going to, you know, it's like, you say it every time. It, in some way, it does feel to me like this time is different. And as a matter of degree, it might be. And as a matter of speed, I really think it will be. Um, and I have some concern about how quickly we can adapt to this kind of change. But I have no real concern that we can eventually adapt to this kind of change. Um, I'm sure the social contract will change. Um, I'm sure most jobs will be different in the future than they are today. But like the deep human drivers don't seem to me likely to go anywhere. Interesting. And I'm obviously different categories of jobs are going to be really differentially affected. For sure. Um, so uh, with President Biden's recent executive order on AI, as well as the congressional hearings on AI regulation, um, there is a concern that regulatory frameworks might solidify the position of established players, might stifle innovation, competition, accessibility. How do you envision AI be regulation, because we really are at a critical moment, being designed to uphold innovation and competition, while ensuring that the field remains accessible for emerging uh, players to pioneer the next transformative technologies? Um, I mean, I think we've faced versions of this with other kinds of regulation. Like, you want to know that the food you buy in a grocery store is unlikely to make you sick. And we kind of all agree that regulation there is good, but you also want to be able to like grow food in your backyard without having to like go through a bunch of like hoops and you get to do that too. Um, I think for AI systems, there will be some threshold above which we say, okay, uh, the system pre presents a level of risk that we don't want to take without reasonable safety precautions. And then I think there will be a level of AI systems where we say, even though there's going to be misuse, um, we should open source these and let people use them. There should be no regulatory burden on companies developing them um, because we're willing to make the innovation and freedom trade-off for the negative safety consequences at level X. And then level Y can be totally different. Mm -hmm. And I totally get the impulse to say any regulatory action is unacceptable because it's just big companies that are going to use it to like for regulatory capture. Um, and you know, if society decides we don't want to regulate AI at all and we'll just take our chances, I'll accept the outcome of a democratic process. It seems to me good to have some voices saying, like, well, you have an opinion. Yeah, for sure. Um, if, if the framing of that question is correct, uh, then it seems to me useful to have some voices saying, let's not act out of fear, but proceed with some reasonable caution. No, that makes sense. Um, speaking of which, um, you said you believe that the upcoming presidential election 
will be the same as the last one. I think we all think that. Uh, but there are lessons to be learned from 2020. Uh, what are these lessons? How can we mitigate the risk AI poses to the democratic process and to uh, the future of democracy in America? You know, maybe maybe the use of advanced AI would be the least interesting thing about this election. <laughs> Check it out. Uh, I, I do think, yeah, I think there will be like better deep fakes, of course, and there will be better like troll farms, of course. Um, what I think is more interesting is trying to get ahead of, to the degree that we can, it's easier said than done, but trying to get ahead of the new things that just weren't possible before. Um, so like customized one-on-one -on -one persuasion, where uh, an AI system reads all of your social media posts and targets something just at you. That wasn't really possible with all of the sort of like online disinformation and trolling of the last election. And that's the kind of new thing that I wish we were taking more seriously. Yeah, I mean, that's the logical extension, as you mentioned, of, you know, advertisements coming up when you're serving away. People know you buy expensive shoes or whatever. I think that things, absolutely. Um, a more local question. Uh, one of MIT's educational priorities is to train tomorrow's leaders to be 